Hello and welcome to the rest is football question and answer episode with me, Gary Lineker, Micah Richards and Alan Shearer. Um, lots of cracking questions uh, this week. Thanks very much for sending them in. Um, let's start straight away. Uh, Jeremy Tavern. We have Champions League football Tuesday and Wednesday and the Masters starting on Thursday. Is this the best sporting week of the year? We're recording this on the Tuesday morning prior to the Champions League games. Um, yes, yes, gr- yes. <laughs> what a week. What a week Do you know sport. what Masters is, Michael? Uh, <laughs> is that a school teacher? <laughs> if it is you'll be in trouble soon um, it is one of the great sporting weeks of the year though isn't it your quarterfinals of the Champions League with oh. a couple of cracking games and then Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday stuck by the television set every evening for the Masters can you remember years ago when we was, I was sat there and you said to me I can't believe you're working on Masters Sunday again. I've made the same mistake again. I'm working match of the day on Sunday. Can you believe it? Oh. So you've, got to look, you've got to plan these things and put them in your diary, Alan. I know, I know. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. I was thinking, I just realised a couple of weeks ago. Can, can you tell me what the obsession is with golf? I, and I, and I, for those who love it, no disrespect, but could you explain, please, what, why you love it so much? You can go first, Alan. Trying to get a little white ball in a hole, Micah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. <laughs> and as least shots as possible. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it, isn't it, Gaz? <laughs> well, it, it is. Um, but, but I don't know. Let me try. Let me try. Right. First and, f- first and f- foremost, it's, it's a good social game. So you can spend hours with a few mates um, or people you don't like, if you wish. Um, <laughs> and you go around and it's a beautiful walk most of the time. Um, if it's a sunny day, it's competitive. It's unbelievably difficult. Um, it's the most frustrating thing on the planet. Yeah. There's no question about that. Yeah. I think all, all golfers will, will agree with that. But when you have a good day, when you play well, it's amazing. Um, and there's, there's, I don't think there's anything quite like it. On on a beautiful sunny day, a four, five hour walk, following a golf ball around, playing well, is just joy. I heard, uh, I heard Justin Rose on TV this morning, and um, I think it was John Watson from the BBC was interviewing him. He said, "What's the, uh, what's the big deal with Augusta?" And he said, "It's like." Because you're walking around this immaculate, this place, he said, it's like the Chelsea Flower Show and walking around on immaculate grass where everyone is so respectful. And it is, isn't it? I mean, the the the, the colour, everything else about Augusta is just just incredible. Yeah, It's beautiful. Anyway, we should move on yes. because this is not the rest is golf. <laughs> so, <laughs> not yet. Not it yet. might be by the end of the week. Um, here's one from David Johnston who says, we see very few chipped goals these days. Not the one or like little dinks over the goalkeepers, but goals like Eric Cantona versus Sunderland, Davo Schuker versus Schmeichel. Any thoughts on why? I've got a couple of thoughts. Go on. One, I think a lot of goalkeepers stay a little bit deeper towards their line now. And the other thing is goalkeepers are massive now. Much bigger than they were, certainly, when I played. And, and a chip was a genuine... You used to edge of the box. If the keeper was on the six-yard box, you'd fancy um, chipping over him. But not so much now. They're all about six foot five, six, seven, aren't they? It wasn't quite a chip, but you've seen one from about 50 yards at the weekend, Bruno Fernandes. I know it wasn't a chip, but... Um, yeah, I get that. I understand that, guys, yeah. And, yeah, I've never really thought of that, to be honest. Um Hmm. Is it that keepers are maybe a little bit more agile? I don't. I, I don't want to be disrespectful to the older uh, the keepers. I, I don't know. It's just a question. But the, the keepers I used to see back in the days were massive. Couldn't really move. And and now the positioning of the goalkeepers uh, is just different. I, I would say maybe. I think the uh, the goalkeeping trade has become more. I mean this. Training and everything's changed, doesn't it? I suppose. I mean, it's, it, the you know the game evolves in all positions. It evolves, and people get bigger, stronger, quicker, fast. You know, 
better technique, better thing. Everything is better because the pitches are better and all that kind of stuff as well. And maybe that's another thing. You don't play in a quagmire anymore. So you can imagine trying to jump out of thick mud. <laughs> <laughs> Get your feet off the ground. You do quite well. Um, but I don't know if there's any um, science behind it other than probably size, I would say. I mean, Peter Shilton's about six foot. Um, and he was the best, I'd in certainly... English goalkeeper that I saw him when I when I was growing up and actually played with him as well. Um, whereas nowadays, I think I think Kasper Schmeichel was only just over six foot as well. But um, and so I don't know what it is, but I think size mainly because most of them are enormous, so it's bloody difficult to chip them. Yeah, I don't know though. When you go back in my day, I mean, you look at it, what I don't know, Schmeichel is. I mean, he's he's a man mountain, Peter Schmeichel, isn't he? I don't think he's. A, I I wouldn't say he's above six one six two. Peter, would you? It's a bit bigger than that, isn't he? Yeah, maybe. No, there's some big ones, but I'm, you know, I think generally human beings just get bigger, don't they? I think that's a fact, generally, over the period. What do I know about that? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dan Francis, as a Brit living in the US, I've noticed a real increase in the popularity of real football over here. Uh, partly, I think, due to shows like Wrexham and Ted Lasso, partly due to the excellent Premier League coverage. Do you ever see a time when the US men's team will be genuine international contenders or do you think the other sports here will always take the best athletes? Well, Alan, you've just been there. Yeah, I mean, the in the interest over there is uh, is huge and I've, I've, I've watched it sort of grow over the last... 10 years or so, um, the first time you sort of went there for the Premier League to what it is now. I mean, it is, it is, the interest in it is incredible. Whether, I mean, I suppose, as we said at the weekend, didn't we? I suppose Messi's also got a, um, uh, played a, a part in that, in a role in that, because the the interest in him and in Miami and everything else is, is, is gone off the charts and rightly so, because the number of followers that, that he's got, then will follow him into the uh, into the uh, the US. So um, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Whether it'll ever, ever be number one sport over there, I'm not quite so sure. But um, the interest is massive. I think if 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 they took it proper seriously in terms of number one sport, like Alice said, I think they'd have a massive massive chance because it's so it, it, America is so diverse as well so you're not just getting Americans you have people over there from all sorts of back, backgrounds if you look at athletics like fitness wise strength wise they can compete if they just had the coaching then definitely i yeah i would say they could yeah i think also if if they could produce their own superstar that would make a big difference and um there is one coming through that they think. I mean, I'm always a bit wary about these with youngsters, but um, apparently Manchester City are, 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 are leading the race to sign um, a wonder kid called Cavan Sullivan. He's only 14. He's already got the nickname Captain America. So at the moment, he's said to be um, leaning towards Real Madrid. Uh, sorry, said to be leaning towards uh, Manchester City rather than Real Madrid, Bayern Munich and PSG. So... Uh, maybe there's a superstar coming you. Um, Wait till he hears Newcastle are interested in him. Yeah, he'll run a mile. <laughs> he'll go, where's that? <laughs> Newcastle? <laughs> right. The time. Oh, we've got one of these boys. By Ben Shawsell. Oh! <laughs> this, 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 is, this is pretty brutal, this one too. Saka, Foden, Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they mean Arnold Palmer even on Masters Week. Oh my God! Yeah, who wants to go first? Oh my God! We're gonna get chastised for this. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, because we can we can oh, we can state man. that they're all wonderfully talented, gifted young players that we'd all yeah, like. Don't take this seriously, anyone. Okay, it's just a. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll okay. go first. I'll go set on. the standard. Go on, Big Meeks. Bye, Foden. Bench, Saka. Sell, Palmer. That's what I'm going to go with. 
I, I, I'll go along with that. I'll go with that as well. I think, and it, it makes me feel slightly <laughs> queasy to put Saka on the bench <laughs> and sell Palmer because who would want yeah. to sell a player that yeah, good? Exactly. Only Manchester City would do something that stupid. <laughs> uh, oh, the... <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you think, Alan? Um, buy Foden, sell Palmer. Yeah. It's the exact same. Yeah, one. same or the same three. Here's one for you, and I I'm slightly reticent about asking this question because I'm who's I'm it to? To Big Meeks. Oh, 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 I yes, I'm I'm a little bit nervous oh, about the answer. Oh. How did the nickname Big Meeks come about? <laughs> <laughs> be careful, Michael. There might be kids listening here. Well, there's a PG version and the, the PG version. <laughs> <laughs> is I think it's self-explanatory is it not <laughs> <laughs> what you're big headed <laughs> I got big guns uh, big <laughs> chest I had a six pack for about ten years so yes that's why they called me big I think it was Joe Hart who's, who, who said it big meeks from yeah. when we was young and it just stuck to be fair and then uh, everyone just started using it and yeah. uh, no word of a lie, people always ask me that. Why do you call yourself Big Meeks? I said, I don't call myself Big Meeks. People call me Big Meeks. You've called yourself Big Meeks <laughs> loads of times on this podcast. <laughs> you see why I'm saying Big Meeks all the time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but Big Meeks is like a, 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 a caricature. Is that, is that the right word? Of 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 oneself, isn't it? It's like I've heard big, you call being called worse. <laughs> big Meeks is not a real person, is it? Big Big Meeks no, is like not. a version of one of my personalities that comes out when I'm on TV. The real Micah. Well, you make sure it doesn't come out on TV, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to see that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And sometimes it really comes out. Depends. Uh, oh no, no! <laughs> Too much information. Uh, I've got another question for you. You're on fire here. Come on, from Eldon. Question for Big Meeks. God. Wow. Uh, what are your day-to-day -day meals? To have so much energy and laughter and joy, night and day is impressive. Whatever you're having, I need that in my life. Oh my God! Chicken. 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 I had the best news, probably. You know, you have commercials, you get to work for BBC and Sky and CBS and League of the Rome. But the best possible news I could have ever received about two years ago. What did I say to, say to you a couple of weeks ago? I'm a chicken connoisseur <laughs> and I've only gone and agreed a Nando's Black card! <laughs> yes! And for those, and for those who don't know what a Nando's black card is, it means you get free Nando's whenever you want. <laughs> oh my goodness. You're going to be enormous, <laughs> man. <laughs> what do you mean it's going to be? <laughs> so in answer to the question, protein. They'll regret that. They'll lose all their profits. <laughs> I'm going to eat about a house and home. <laughs> Other chickens are available. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, if you wow. want to sponsor us, of course. How do you get, what is it, a, a red card? It's a, a black, black card. A black card, and what, so where do you get that from? Did uh, they just got in touch, and honestly, I was a tweet, it was in my old Twitter. I tried, ah. I've been trying to get one I'll of tell these you what, cards. After this episode, we'll all get one, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to get this black card. No word of a lie for about 15 years and I'll be rejected, rejected, rejected. And now they've finally come to their senses. <laughs> uh, must, must be the podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> must be. You watch over the next six months, you're just going to see them explode, <laughs> get bigger and bigger every single week. Brilliant. Um, from Nazro. What's the strangest halftime team talk you've ever experienced? What a great question that is. Yeah, I, I had one with, um, I, think I've, I'm, I think I might have told this before on um, Match Today Top 10, Peter Shreves, um, the then Tottenham manager. And um, 
He's quite he was quietly spoken, Peter. He's a really good coach. Um and he had a slightly high pitched, um slightly Cockney accent really, even though I think he was Welsh, um, Peter Shreves. And um we were playing Wimbledon away and I think we were God, we were bloody awful in the first half. I think we were three or four down at half time. We walked around and I thought, finally, he's done, definitely going to have to give him, everyone a bollocking for this. And um, he sat, everyone everyone was sitting down waiting for his words and he, and he just went, well, boys, we don't appear to be all singing from the same song sheet. <laughs> and that was it. So I thought that was quite... And um, what happened in the second <laughs> half? Um, we were shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember too many half times one. Full time, I can definitely remember. Half times, I'm struggling. I mean, I'm sure there's been some. Full times, there's, we've all, I mean, it's gone crazy in the dressing yeah. room, fights and everything as, we, as we've spoken about. But half times, I can't remember too many. No, uh, obviously, I've told the story about when I uh, kicked the uh, food and it went all over the, the dressing room. But do you remember when was that the... <laughs> was it a Nando's? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't Nando's. I wouldn't have kicked that. Um, <laughs> while Mancini was basically... It was, it was a way. European game. I've told him this story before. But do you remember when we seen Platy at the um, at Wembley yeah. for the, Eng mm. the England game versus Brazil? And yeah. Platy goes to me, do, do you remember Effin and Jeff and me that day? So... As I've sort of basically kicked all the food, Platy's come over to me, and he's the assistant manager at that time, and he was going, <laughs> he goes to me, oh, you've had the best game of your life. I don't even know what the manager is talking about. And I'm like to Platy, fuck off. You just basically said, <laughs> no, we need to, we need to get Platy on this to, for him to tell the story because it was yeah. just, the, the manager's absolutely hammered me and Platy has tried to get me back on side. So he said, basically, I've had the best game ever. And that just made me more raging. We'll have to get him on. We'll have to get him on. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good shout. Um, Ethan, why doesn't the idea of scrapping VAR seem to be taken seriously? Surely getting rid of something that actively makes a spectator sport worse... Uh, while not doing what it was introduced to do in the first place properly should at least be a realistic option. Is it pride on the part of those in charge that they don't want to admit it's not fit for purpose or a sunk cost fallacy that means we're stuck with it? We're stuck with it. It's, uh, they've, in, they've invested too much into it. They need, to, they need to, I mean, I know it's, it hasn't worked anywhere near as well as it should have um, or it hasn't been used like it was told um, to us that right at the very beginning in terms of re-refereeing, in terms of clear and obvious. But some of the laws are... I mean, the lawmakers, seriously, that's half the problem, is the lawmakers. They make it so complicated. It, it's hard enough anyway for referees, but they make it so complicated for them and ridiculously hard at times with the mad, crazy, over-the-top laws that should be so simplistic. Mm. And that's part yeah. of the problem. Handball being one of them, obviously. Handball being one of them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the same. I think we're stuck with it. They've invested not not just um, not just in people and time, but also um, a lot of money has gone into it. But, you know, the setups of everywhere and stuff like that. I think it's just of... I think it is a question, really, of getting the best out of a bad lot. I agree with you, Alan, about um, a lot of the law changes and the, the the complicated nature of them now, and trying trying to work out situation for every given incident yeah. is is absurd. Yeah. Um, so they need to simplify that. Um, you know, I, I've said many times on here and elsewhere that I think we should go to an appeal system to at least limit the um, the invasion of our game. Um, as much as we possibly can, um, but it's 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 hard to know because these things, you know, these things are not in our control, and 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 the thing is, the control of our game now is is basically in the hands of referees because they're the ones that are coming up with the laws of the game now, not only uh, officiating them, which which is I think is is also a shame for referees as well. But are we are we a part to to, to blame in in that? Not at all, the... Michael. We're not the slightest bit to blame. <laughs> because we've, we've been talking about it, you know, before. And Alan's exactly right when he said, 
Um, it's different to how it, we were told it was going to be used. So we understand yep. that part. But we wanted it, didn't we? We wanted it. So is, is there any point turning our back on it right now? Surely it can only get better. It can't get worse, can it? But I agree really? with the actual question. I, I, I don't like VR anymore. I was the one who campaigned for it. I think it was a mistake, but I, I don't think it's right to turn our back right now. Okay, well, I think, I think we all thought it would be something that it's not, but I don't see how it's possible for it to be perfect. It can't be because ultimately it still comes down to human beings and human beings make mistakes. Um, there are sides of it, obviously, um, technology-wise, goal line technology, and I think, I think the offside thing will eventually be here that um, it'll be automatic, um, which is not a bad, necessarily a bad thing because it will be should be quick. Yeah. Um, but the other side, once it comes, it, it, it can't be perfect. It's impossible to be perfect. And that's what we wanted. And we'll never know what there'll be a high bar. Then there's a low bar. Then there's a high bar again. Yeah. And all this. The last, the last thing I'll say on this is that go back. What was it? Four years or whatever. How long of it was when yeah. it came out? And I always go back to this point. We wanted it in the, in the format that they said, the format that they said and told us was that you were not in capital letters, not going to re-referee the games, yeah. where blatantly that's happening every single game now. And it's only for the clear and obvious, which is clearly not the case. They are re-refereeing, and the decisions that they're making and overturning are not clear and obvious. That's what they told us, and it's not happening. Yeah, I agree. But I think defining what clear and obvious is, it will vary between different people, and therein lies, therein lies the problem. Well, they used the they used the Thierry Henry thing as an example, didn't they? The handball Thierry Henry, which was obviously well, handball Diego Maradona. Obviously, that, that, those things would be spotted immediately, and in that sense, you could you, you can certainly argue well the the game is fairer because of those incidents, but it's the ones. Where does clear and obvious stop yeah. and start? Well, a that's huge the problem, problem and that's the problem that will always exist, yeah. in, in in my opinion. So, yeah. anyway, we just we yeah. we spend tend to spend a lot of our lives these days talking about VR. <laughs> um, right, next question, Colin Edmondson, uh, a question from Australia. Um, for all three of us, just finished watching highlights of the Wolves versus West Ham game and wanted to ask what your thoughts are about penalties being taken like the Paketar one this weekend. Should the officials begin cancelling the penalty or if players do these stupid stop-start runs prior to taking the kick? What is the actual rule on that? You, 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 well, there used know. to be a rule where you weren't allowed to do yeah, that. Space, uh, yes, but you can now. Yeah, we well, can can't. Now. But I, I think you're not allowed. You're not allowed to stop with a way. It's done. It still have to be in motion. So yeah, that was yeah, yeah. That that was the rule as I remember it. See, I don't see the I don't see the not problem. the kind of motion I had on the pitch. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I don't see the issue with it. It's you, you've got the advantage. You've been given the penalty for yeah. a reason. So until you've actually touched that ball, what does it what does it matter? I mean, the goalkeeper's allowed to bounce along along the line like a raven lunatic, yet a player is not or, or wasn't allowed to sort of stop, start, or whatever. I don't see the issue in it, me. It's your penalty. You do what you want with it until you you touch that ball. That's it. Yeah, but I think on on that, I'll for it. They've already made it harder for goalkeepers where they've got to have at least one foot on the line. So harder for goalkeepers. How's it harder for goalkeepers? They've basically got to stay until the ball's been hit. So if you've got the technique of a, a Gary Lineker or Alan Shearer, it, it's like I think it, what is the percentage? Like seventy-five percent of scoring a penalty with, with that with a keeper that has got to made it even. It must have, took it up to 85% for the strikers as well. So I get your point from a striker's point of view, but it is making it harder for the goalkeepers, them having to stay on the line. Well, if they didn't have to stay on the line, they could just run right to the penalty spot. <laughs> well, do you, do you remember Dudek in the Champions League final? Yeah. Do you see where he was? Yeah. That was ridiculous. Indeed. Uh, right. Andy asks... Loving the podcast. My question is, as the Euros are coming up in the summer, would each of you answer who will win the tournament? Who will be top scorer of the tournament and who will be player of the tournament? 
I'll tell you what, we'll answer the last two um, when the tournament is about to start. We'll, we'll, we'll say reserve ourselves for that. But at the moment, we will answer who we think will win the tournament. England, Harry Kane, Jude Bellingham. Hey! Oh, he's going to answer all three. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> Is that, I, I think he's asking who will win the tournament rather than what we think we want to happen. Um, but actually, I think he, I I fancy England this time. Um, I do. Yeah. Never have a better chance. No. Um, I, I've you know you always get stick whenever you tip England, um, but I've not tipped them for an awfully long time, um, and I think for a couple of decades we we weren't that competitive but i think with this young lot yeah um as we've shown in the last three tournaments it we're not won one but um they've been very competitive and they'll go close um who do you think will win the tournament i think france are probably the other favorites i think it's not much between them mm. yeah i think so england france portugal what about Germany if they get on a bit of a roll? Home team. I mean, they're not, I know they're not yeah. fancy, not the most spectacular team, but home advantage, all yeah. of that, and a couple of young players coming through. I'm going France. Mm. I, I, I just think, I, I think you're right in terms of individuals. Are, are we the best team here? I'm not sure. Maybe very close, but I think France, uh, just, yeah, I think. I, Something with with Killed and Giroud and Griezmann, and now they've got Giroud's st- like thirty seven. I'm not, but he, he put the way they play, it's just perfect for the that allows Mbappe to do what he needs to do, and Griezmann as well, and Saliba can't even get into the team. That's how much cover they've got at uh, center out. No, that's just a mistake. <laughs> 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 that's a mistake if they leave him out. Um, right, here's uh, Sean. One for Gary and Al. I'm not sure why he doesn't think this applies to you, Micah. Uh, what did you guys do with your hat trick match balls? <laughs> and are, are there any special ones you still have today? <laughs> um, I used to have a few lying around. I was funny enough. I was looking for for them the other day just because I like to reminisce about my hat tricks. That's a joke, by the way. I didn't really do that. Um, um, you you must have you got a few lying around in there. Hey, Alan. It's actually how that's really weird. They've asked that question. 9th of April, nineteen eighty-eight. Back in the day, today, this this day in nineteen eighty-eight, I made my debut as a seventeen-year-old and scored a hat trick. And that question wasn't planned. How spooky is that? That's that's mental. And does does do you celebrate this day every year, Alan? Is that <laughs> is that how you know? Is it like your birthday? <sighs> <sighs> this was a special day, the 9th of April. Yeah. That's um, amazing. De- I've still got, amazing. I've still got debut, that. I've still got that ball. The old, uh, I've yeah. got it, yeah. How old was you then? 17. Wow. Yeah. I bet you never thought then, when you won that match ball, that eventually you would look like the match ball. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I've got all of my uh, hat trick balls. Yeah, I've got. I've mine are somewhere. I've, I've, what do you mean somewhere? somewhere? I do not know where they are. We're like what hidden in the loft somewhere or something well, like they, that. Are they? I, I think. I think I know where they are. Uh, the, yeah, and they're kind of hidden in a in, in a loft, and and there's a, f- a few bags of England caps and stuff like that. I really should. I got my golden boots out, Micah. We've got to get them out. The, the people want it. Not now, but I mean, we need to. You know, we bring our. Our stuff out and, and boast yeah. about well not boast but you know give a bit of insight into what we've what we've got would be nice as you're uh, as you're on the 18th fairway is it not about time you got them out and started to look to sell them <laughs> well the boys I think the boys have got their eyes on them. <laughs> my lads uh, cheeky bastard the 18th fairway <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, this leads me on nicely to another question from Nathaniel that does apply to Micah. Is it true Micah won Player of the Month and why hasn't he got the award on display? You know what? Did you win it? Of course I won it. Of course I won it. I think it was in... Was it in 2007? Go go on. Tell him. Go in. Is that not that Barclays thing behind you over your right shoulder, is it? No, I've got many of them. That, that was just play it, play of the match. It's you know. Uh, oh right. So, okay. Have you still got your player of the month trophy? You know what? I 
I think I have somewhere, but uh, I got burgled when I was in Manchester and I lost a lot of my stuff. So yeah, I'll try and find it, but I've, I don't know where everything is, to be honest. Uh, producer Harry has just um, showed me a note. Oh. How about how about this big note? Okay. You're going to like this. Go on. Micah Richards has won a Player of the Month trophy. Kevin De Bruyne never has. Oh! Yeah! <laughs> That's what I mean. People need to put some respect on my name, Big Meats. Kevin De Bruyne has never won a player. That's no, mad, really? isn't it? Wow. That is, yeah. sca- that is scandalous. Unbelievable. That is, that is scandalous. There's, a, qu- there's that- a question here from Paul Smith, which I, I have to read out for obvious reasons. Question for Gary. Does he have a comedy genius writer for his social media posts? Or are they, or, or are they all his own work? <laughs> no, but please, can you explain to them? Pete, you, you, you've got a problem, haven't you? Yeah, I can't, yeah, dad, what, dad just jokes. One. <laughs> dad, I got this, like, just one. Yeah. Oh, go on, tell uh, the people. Dad, if... dad, dad joke Tourette's. <laughs> can't provoke him. No, but that's very kind of you, Paul. Um, I, I don't have a, a comedy genius writer. I have a really shit one. <laughs> um, but no, it's all my own work. Um, so I'm to blame for all my cheesy, crappy puns, but I can't help it. Um, one more question from Jerome. Guys, could you please speak of the toll that a professional football career has on one's family relationship, kids, etc. I think probably post-football, it's more difficult. I think during it, I mean, it's a wonderful life, mm. isn't it? You have a, you, you know, you, yes, you travel a little bit, but you do spend an awful lot of time at home as well because you, you, it's not like you work 40, 50 hours a week. Um, obviously, you're very well recompensed and and you travel everywhere with with luxury um so i think the difficulty is at the end of football for a lot of yeah. for a lot of players um you know the fame gradually goes away the salary disappears um and because there are not that many great jobs for footballers and outside of coaching some people invest what they've got in business they might lose it etc there's only so many jobs in tv um i think the divorce rate for footballers um between 35 and 40 years old is some ridiculous figure like 70 odd percent um so you know however much you earn once professional football stops it's a difficult thing um to 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 replace in your life and can have a varying effects on 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 different individuals i think certainly traveling wise i mean but we don't travel off as much as the cricketers or the golfers and whatever you do. I know you might be away every other week or whatever it is, but when you look at the cricketers, the, t- the amount of time that they spend away at a time, like two and three months at a time, the top cricketers, um, certainly not as bad as that, no. It's tough, isn't it? Because no, no matter what we say or, you know, I think we people want to know sort of insight. It's difficult when you've got kids and you are travelling there's this sort of feeling because I've I've got a seven year old uh, son now, and I miss I miss birthdays, I miss not Christmas now, which Christmas is good, um, and it's just that that feeling of being present for me that I find that the, the toughest because a lot of the work is in London for me, and then I'm traveling and I'm going to match the day or Sky or whatever, and it's just. Missing the, the the vital years is is what I need to to work on, and I've talked about this a little bit before. I think it's always tough. I was listening to a a podcast with Wes Brown on the other day, and he was talking about um, he went he went bankrupt, and it's it, it's tough, isn't it? Because people always ask that question: how how can you earn millions and go bankrupt? And Obviously, you guys, I don't know what it's like for you guys, but when you are, when you have a lot of money so young, you have people around you who, they, they want the best for you, but they want the best for themselves as well. So every inch they take in, they take in, you trust, and you trust this person to give money to, and then by the end of it, there's, there's, there's nothing left. And people ask, well, how can that happen? It's just because when you're a footballer, you're relying and concentrating on the football side of things. And, you know, like yourself, the pres- pundits and presenters are saying, 
why, why are they concentrating on things outside football? Concentrate on your football. You do, and you still get stung anyway. So it is difficult, but I mean, it's not difficult in reality to what other people are going through. And I think that is the the point of it. And I've always been a happy, happy person. Anywhere from Chapel Town, where I'd slept in the bedroom with three of my, two of my brothers and three of my, my older brother used to come from Birmingham at the time. But it, it doesn't matter. Money doesn't change me. I'm just happy regardless. That's a lovely way to finish, uh, Micah. Um, beautifully put. And um, Alan and myself now are going to spend the next few days watching golf and football. And it doesn't get much better than that. Here, here. So goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. <laughs> <laughs>